Hi, how are you doing, Dean Lawson? Good to see you again. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, well, I wanted to take this opportunity to congratulate you again on your Clyde Ferguson Award. Um, it's oh, an okay. honor and well-deserved. Um, um, as you know, we recognize your public service, your teaching, and your outstanding scholarship. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, you know, you are the immediate predecessor or winner of the Clyde Ferguson Award. So, you know, that it's a great honor, uh, you know, with, I guess, hundreds or thousands of people in the minority section of the AALS. I was just sort of like, you know, they have so many people to pick from. It, uh, it really makes you think like, all right, I must have done something right. Right. <laughs> yes. And the impact that you've made in in your area of expertise and bringing the Fourth Amendment alive, I think, for so many students um, and scholars. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. And, you know, we go way back in terms of doing these conferences together. Right. We've had conferences where we've presented papers together and I've always learned so much from your work. Um, I appreciate it and I've taught the book that you uh, worked on on criminal procedure. So it's uh, it's good to talk today about criminal procedure. Yes, and your work has inspired me in many of my classroom presentations and the panels we've done together where we've, I think, collectively pushed the envelope um, mm -hmm. on where the boundaries are of our constitutional protections and maybe even gaps in protections. I don't know if I'd fully thought about before right now, even in our Terry versus Ohio case, mm -hmm. there was a prosecutor behind that case who thought it was appropriate to charge the case, notwithstanding mm -hmm. the search, or at the time, maybe a search that was not traditionally per permissible. Right. Yeah, I, well, it's, you know, the. The famous facts that we talk about all the time to students are that this white police officer, Officer McFadden, was patrolling downtown Cleveland. And I should say I've clerked in uh, I clerked in Cleveland, and so I've seen downtown Cleveland. It's, you know, sort of uh, that downtown, at least when I was there in the 90s, was fairly vibrant. Now we're going way back to the late 1960s. So I don't know exactly what it was like, but he sees these two young black men sort of walking back and forth in front of a jewelry, I think a jewelry store, and um, and uh, thinks that they must be casing the store, right? So when you tell those facts to students, I find they're like, oh, wait, they walked back and forth 12 different times. Of course they were casing the store. Of course they were going to commit a robbery. And so the case has a certain logic to it where you think like, all right, they might indeed have been up to something um it's funny yeah. when you tell those case facts i would say to the students when i used to uh, teach in miami and those of you who know me know that i have kind of a an itch for fashion right so i would work late and i would be coming home grabbing maybe some takeout and all the store windows you know all the stores are closed and i'm looking in the windows <laughs> yeah. looking at the, the, <laughs> the dresses and i'm thinking about terry i'm like do i look you know, as if maybe I'm casing the joint, or am I just a fashionista who got off work too late to, right. uh, you know, it just depends on the, the context and how your presence is perceived. Yeah, I mean, and that's the big problem with the reasonable suspicion test that they create in Terry is that reasonable suspicion, they say, is would a person of reasonable prudence believe that a crime was afoot or was about to be afoot? Um, and that these people were involved. Um, we talk about the specific and articulable, you know, suspicions or or specific and articulable facts as the test. But what's a specific? I know what a specific fact is. What an articulable fact is? Well, does that just mean if I can say it, then it counts? You know, that that was one of the things that was interesting to me in that case when I teach it is just sort of what does that even mean? Um, and maybe well, more means, than a hunch, right? Yeah, more right. More than a hunch. That's right. They do say that it means more than a hunch. And so the police officer coming upon you would have to have more than a hunch that, you know, you're not just a fashionista, uh, <laughs> which of course you are. I appreciate your fashion sense. Um, but yeah, so so this more than a hunch idea. Um, but then what? It's more than a hunch and it's less than probable cause. 
right, where probable cause used to really mean something. This is before the Gates test, and um, probable cause hasn't been watered down yet. So, but they Professor, stop if you're cause. not if you're not a legal scholar, a criminal law legal scholar, I mean, what what are we really talking about? What you know, what's the backdrop mm -hmm. of the Terry versus Ohio case? Isn't it the Fourth Amendment that has in its core text the standard mm -hmm. of probable cause? How do we get away from that? Yeah, so I guess that's right. So the Fourth Amendment says there shall be no unreasonable searches and seizures, and then it says that no warrant shall issue pre-authorizing a search or seizure, but upon probable cause. And from 1880s to the 1968, when the Terry versus Ohio case came down, people seem to assume that probable cause was the standard if the police were gonna do some kind of search or seizure. So you've got the Fourth Amendment, like you say, and it's saying that you've prob you should have probable cause. Then the court starts creating all these exceptions to the rule even that you have to have a warrant, right? So they say, maybe you don't have to have a warrant. And then Terry is almost saying, maybe you don't have to have probable cause. Um, so I don't know if it, like, uh, I, I hope that helps give some background on the yes. Fourth Amendment. Yeah. So, but only in certain circumstances where the government mm -hmm. feels they need to intervene earlier than probable cause to protect right. the public. Isn't Terry just a public safety, protect the public type of case? Yeah, I mean, that's how they depict it, right? That the uh, public, so basically they're thinking about preventative measures. And the police say, in, and the case says, the police say that they need some tools to be able to intervene earlier in a case like the case they had with Terry and Chilton walking back and forth in front of a store the argument would be, well, why should the police officer have to wait until they draw guns and are in the middle of a you know, potential gun battle to say, hey, stop that. And, and that's how it's often depicted, that this is just preventative for public safety, that when McFadden grabbed Terry and Chilton and the third man cats um, and patted them down, right and felt the weapons on terry and chilton that that was just for public safety to see are they armed if they're armed then there's a good chance that maybe they are trying to commit a robbery and maybe we should investigate and it was illegal for them to have the guns so right there you've got a crime if you're allowed to pat them down but is this a story about terry or is this a story about mcfadden because yeah. you know that whole line of of um discussion about the training and experience of an officer. I mean, that's what I would think about when I was peering in those shop windows that a reasonable officer would not think that this is yeah. criminal. They would know that this is just, you know, a, a girl who needed to still go shopping. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, Anthony Thompson, uh, the scholar out of NYU, I think he's retired now, uh, talked about the fact that the court really came up with this narrative of police officer experience, yes. that the police officer has some kind of training that allows them to tell the difference between a hunch, which they're not allowed to act on, and reasonable suspicion, which they are allowed to act on. Um, and of course, reasonable suspicion is less than probable cause. So we've now created something, there could be nothing, a hunch, and you're not allowed to do anything if you're the police officer, but there could be reasonable suspicion. And then you're allowed, as you say, only a limited stop, right? Like a temporary stop. You can't just throw them in handcuffs, stuff them in the back of the police car. That would probably be an arrest, right? There are some circumstances where that could be done, but generally speaking, they can't do what looks like an arrest, but they can stop them. Well, I think about this McFadden if we're going to call it the McFadden exception or the officer's yeah. training exception, in our role as professors, mm -hmm. right? We have training experience in front of the classroom. We know when students are looking us straight in the eye or when they're looking down, when we're looking for, you know, a volunteer yeah. who probably did the homework. Right. And I guess I felt like that's what the Supreme Court is saying, that we're going to take as real and mm -hmm. as practical what officers observe on the streets and their training and experience of what is, you know, consistent with criminal behavior yeah. and what is consistent with 
innocent behavior. I mean, is that a fair assessment for the court to, court to make? Well, I think, first of all, I love that analogy, right? Because it is like when we're in the classroom, we do sometimes think we know who's read and who hasn't. I try and think, though, that, you know, I don't know for sure what's going on with that student, right? Maybe they're just really shy. We know that, you know, some of the A students will be the students who hardly ever talked, yes. right? So I, I may be, you know, the student may be looking down because they read the case five times, they understand it completely, but they don't like to speak in front of 60 of their closest friends, right? Uh, so to me, that's more like a hunch. And yet the court, as you say, is saying that that experience that a teacher has or that a police officer has allows them to really have a good sense of when somebody is up to no good. Um, you raise yeah. another point through that analogy is we're talking about a high stakes environment, whether you right. know you're in the classroom, you're being called right. upon or you're encountering a police officer. Yeah. We're using ordinary cues, but it's really not ordinary. This is a high stakes environment. You yeah. Might yeah, really is, because what it means is that a police officer is going to get to grope somebody, right? The court says in Terry versus Ohio that the officer is, well, it paraphrases, saying that officers are to, um, how do they put it? Uh, maybe you remember exactly, but basically the feel of the area about the testicles. Um, and that's obviously getting up close and personal with somebody. And it is high stakes, right? We don't want police officers doing that on a hunch. We maybe don't even want them doing it on reasonable suspicion because it's very intrusive to be patted down and groped like that to see if you have a weapon on you. Is there impl implicit bias at play? I mean, I like your mm -hmm. comeback around, we don't know really what's happening with the student. Right. And we're using certain you know, standards and yeah, I mean, we probably uh, ourselves hold stereotypes in the classroom, right? Uh, there used to be a joke about, you know, kids in the back wearing baseball caps. Oh, they're probably, you know, just not interested. The back benchers, they're probably not interested in participation. And sometimes we make those assumptions that that's why they're in the back of the classroom, that they're being casual by wearing a baseball cap, and that that indicates that they're casual about their studies. So on the street, if I'm a police officer and I look at somebody and I don't like the way they dress or uh, I have stereotypes about what a criminal looks like, um, I don't know if we want to credit that as experience as opposed to really just being a hunch. Is it gendered? I know you're an expert in that as well. Are there gender issues that we should be yeah. thinking about? I think there are gendered issues there. Um, I've talked about in an article called Who's the Man about the fact that police officers, they're often, you know, by and large, male and female, a more macho group of people, right? To put it sort of colloquially, right? They, they're ready to, to establish their authority. And certainly police officers do have to establish their authority sometimes, but they may be tempted to just sort of engage in macho posing to show sort of their, you know, they're wearing the uniform, you got to do what they say, as opposed to really discerning that there's a problem here. And the probable cause standard would make them have real evidence that there's a problem here. The reasonable suspicion standard probably gives them more discretion to just sort of push around the local kids and uh, and often it's going to be local boys, right? You know, police focus on teenagers a lot. So they're pushing around the local boys. They're often men themselves. And even if they're not, you know, masculine as a sort of biological identity, um, they're in a field that's macho. And so that's some of what I've talked about, about how there could be some gender dynamics there that the kids don't want to feel like if they're getting pushed around, if they're just becoming men and they're feeling, uh, you know, they're, that they're now supposed to get a certain respect. And the police also don't want to feel that they're being disrespected. And so it allows for a sort of masculinity contest where each side feels like it's being disrespected and that they've got to sort of bow up in order to show who's the man. That was the idea of that article. <laughs> yes, and, and but that could lead you to be detained? 
and and frisked? Yeah, because the Terry versus Ohio standard is so low, right? Reasonable suspicion, usually it's just a couple of things. Um, I think you and I have talked before about the fact that the Wardlow case said that when a police caravan went through a poor, high crime neighborhood, that if somebody ran away from the caravan, looked at the caravan and ran away, that that was enough to be reasonable suspicion. But it seems to me that's, I mean, that's pretty questionable, right? That just because you didn't want to be around the police, you can be stopped and broked. So let me just review for a second, Professor, that I understand the constitutional consequences that we're discussing. Fourth Amendment gives us protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. Yeah. Where probable cause is required and a warrant. Mm -hmm. We know that the, the cases have given exceptions for no warrant. Right. And Terry creates an exception for no probable cause. Yeah. And then the Terry case goes on to be used to other used in other circumstances to even water it down that you're fleeing or running in a neighborhood that that that's a high crime neighborhood so now we can assume that that running is somehow incriminating because yes. the police are in the neighborhood yeah that's a great way of of describing how it develops and i think it raises again the issue of bias that you discussed because um if a police officer has implicit or even explicit racial biases, they may be likely to say they see reasonable suspicion with particularly young Black men when they might not feel that way if they were dealing with young white men, you know, a middle-aged white woman, et cetera. Was this a risk the Supreme Court really knew about when they, they ruled on the Terry case? Well, they were on notice of it, that's for sure. In the case, uh, they got a brief from the NAACP, uh, the famous Black Civil Rights Organization, saying that if the police got this power, it would re lead to widespread harassment of African Americans. And the court acknowledged that that was a possibility. And then it said, but we, we can't really do anything about that. They, they said, on the other side, the police say they need tools to help public safety and to prevent crimes before they happen. So they sort of balanced it out and compromised it, I would say. I mean, wh what do you think about that sort of compromise aspect of it? Yeah, it was a, the great compromise, the way I present it to students, where the court really gave way to the pressures, um, some legitimate, I think, of the of the government needing to intervene early and, um, to prevent crime, to keep the community safe, but at the great cost, maybe, opportunity cost and constitutional protection cost of individuals who would have government intrusion in situations where there was no probable cause and no warrant. Mm -hmm. So that risk that you know was telegraphed and mapped out and articulated by Amiki and others in the argument in 1968, was that real? Have we realized any um, consequences from the Terry decision? Well, I think unfortunately we have. There's the Floyd decision out of the Eastern District of New York, which found that the New York Police Department was using specifically this power, the power to do a Terry stop and frisk to harass young, black and brown, black and Latino men. And uh, the judge in that case, Judge Scheinlin, found as a matter of um, evidence, finding of facts, that the police had a policy of focusing on young black and brown men, and that, I, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was at least 400,000 of the stops um, of the you know several million stops over a ten year period, at least four hundred thousand of them, I believe, were unconstitutional, right? And that's because this is there's this uh, bleeding between um, having this power, which is so easy to use, and then abusing that power. And the she found the NYPD was abusing that power and specifically against young black and brown males. 
Well, the the follow up I would have to ask you is like, how safe is this case making us? I I remember yeah. the cases you're talking about, and they were very um, inaccurate in identifying, even using this potentially unconstitutional method. But they mm. were not identifying armed and dangerous yeah. individuals. Yeah. So I think at the my recollection is that something like eight percent of the people that they stopped had either evidence of crime for which they are arrested, right? So that's one thing, and that's important. But that would still mean that you had to stop 12.5 people to get this arrest, and maybe that wouldn't be worth it. But actually, that 8% also included people who had citations that they were given, so just a ticket, right, that they were given. So not a gun, not that they had committed some significant crime, but just they were given a ticket for littering or something like that. Um, and so I believe that Judge Shilin found that only in the relevant pool of stops, something like 1.5% of them was yielding a weapon. So, Professor, let me just understand. So ter the Terry Court were, was really considering burglary and robbery and yeah. The, the prevention of violent crime, but you're saying in New York it was being used for almost identifying no crime or petty yeah. crime or citationable type of crimes. Absolutely. Because of James Q. Wilson uh, and others, their scholarship, um, criminology scholarship, uh, they were using broken windows theory. And broken windows theory said that you should seek out people committing petty offenses and use those as an excuse to try and find people who might be committing heavier offenses. The theory was that if you harass particular groups of people who are likely to commit crime, i.e. young black and brown males is how they, the police saw it, that you will bring down crime. Um, and that was not proven to be uh, to be the case that the that the stop and frisk policy actually brought down crime. Crime, unfortunately, is not so susceptible to harassing people out of committing crime. So, is it that Terry, the case Terry versus Ohio, is a precursor or, I guess, an um, exacerbating factor on police brutality? Yeah, it definitely could be, right? Because uh, as Devin Carbato out of UCLA has said, and, and some others have said, the more contacts you have with people, the more um, police excessive use of force you're going to have. Even if a police excessive use of force is rare, if you concentrate all your energy in Black and Brown communities, there's going to be more excessive use of force in those communities. That comment uh, makes me think of a case out of Massachusetts that mm. went empirically into this question, because like the Wardlow case we talked about earlier, you can use the Terry logic to say, you know, flight, unprovoked flight from a police officer is evidence of crime or incriminating behavior. But the yeah. Massachusetts court came to a, a slightly different conclusion based on empirical evidence of, I think, the Boston Police Department. Yeah, so I'm from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, originally. I'm actually, uh, I grew up with Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. Um, and so they were on the Super Bowl recently extolling their Boston roots. But they're not from Boston. They're from Cambridge, just like me. Um, however, Cambridge is over the river from Boston. And there had been a lot of evidence that the Boston police were racial profiling and focusing especially on people in the Black community. Um, and so because of that and because of uh, disproportionate excessive force against members of the Black community, the Commonwealth versus Warren Court correctly said that when a Black man runs from the police, that is not good enough evidence that there's reasonable suspicion that they committed a crime. Maybe there's something else that suggests reasonable suspicion, but that alone should not be enough. What a rich discussion for February. I mean, yeah. it, it circles around some of the things we discuss every February and yeah. in our history and uh, our, our contributions. 
Wow. Yeah, Black History Month, right? It's it's great when we get the Black History Month every year and we can focus on um, the contributions, as you say, that African Americans have made to this country. But also, I think it helps everyone to pay attention to lingering implicit and explicit bias against African Americans. And this strikes me as not just an example, right? Police focusing on African Americans. Um, but also uh, it, we can look at the roots, right? The roots may be in a legal case like Terry versus Ohio. So going back 50 years, you know, we, we see the roots of contemporary bias. I, I like that you're making that connection to the roots because I almost see it as invisible bias because if this mm. is the law of the land, how can anyone be blamed for being biased? They're just applying the constitutional law as it stands. Yeah, I tend to think of it as even if the law is correct, that you should police officers ought to be able to stop somebody on reasonable suspicion. Police officers can still get it wrong that they have reasonable suspicion because they are biased. So when they stop somebody because they are biased, they're not actually following the law of the land. They're abusing the discretion afforded them by the law of the land because the law of the land makes it hard to tell when the person should be stopped. I, I like that, Professor. You're saying even though police officers have this in their toolbox, mm -hmm. that they should not always use this tool. It's not at going to serve them in all consequences as well as they might hope. Yeah, just in the ways that we said, right, that there's a very low hit rate, as Song Richardson, your co-author, yes. has talked about, right? Yes. Um, so if we've got a low hit rate from stops and frisks, and then it turns out that they're very much subject to and are being used for racial bias, maybe we should use that tool much less, if not, if ever. Well, I think that's a lesson uh, for this conversation, to think about how to, you know, judiciously use and more, you know, narrowly tailored use these tools that the Supreme Court has afforded. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say let's make them history, <laughs> reasonable oh. suspicion, stops and frisks. But I know that, uh, that you might not go that far. <laughs> well, let me just tease that out for a second. So you would even propose, um, even though this tool is there, mm -hmm. police departments could take it off the table. Uh, mm -hmm. prosecutors' offices could kind of disfavor it and say they're yeah. not going to pursue cases that involve um, reasonable suspicion encounters, but require probable cause for any case that they're going to bring. Yeah. Yeah. And that does sound like a big ask. <laughs> well, because facts are, um, these cases are so fact specific yeah. and a broad rule like that would be hard, but it's, it's great to unpack the Fourth Amendment and get um, your expertise around the impact of this. Yours, talk. Yeah, thank you. I, I've enjoyed the conversation. I always learn when I talk to you. The same. And I hope to have you here at the University of Washington uh, to speak to the students more often. I'd, I'd love to come out there. Thank you.